Purple Daily is daily Vikings entertainment. Do you just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die? I will ride with this group. Seriously, man. Please. And away we go. All right, Purple Daily on draft. We're coming at you a little bit later in the week here. We usually come at you on Mondays. Instead, we're coming at you on a Tuesday. Purple Daily on draft every week on the Purple Daily YouTube channel and podcast feed. Declan Goff, Tyler Fornis, Miles Gorham here to take you through another edition of Purple Daily on draft. Uh, the Vikings released a awesome behind-the-scenes kind of video of their war room. I feel like some other teams like have that stuff ready to go almost pronto on draft week. And uh, the great folks at Vikings Entertainment Network sat on it for about three weeks and finally released 20 minutes of some great behind-the-scenes stuff that we were going to get into right now on Purple Daily on Draft. Hit the like button, subscribe button, too, for daily Vikings entertainment. Uh, so we were talking a little bit off mic, boys, and we heard about this line, but I don't know if we figured out it came from the Combine, I believe it was what it was, but McCarthy said that I'd run through a brick wall for Kevin O'Connell, and I believe that was also reported mm-hmm. to right before the draft. But I kind of wonder what... KOC said to JJ McCarthy or wonder what like really sparked that interaction for having those type of words for him. Cause I mean, yes, Kevin O'Connell has won a Super Bowl as a coordinator and he's mm-hmm. just a very raw, raw guy. That's kind of who he is. And I think, a, I think a JJ McCarthy probably fits his mold pretty well of what he wants in a quarterback. Mm-hmm. And I think those personalities kind of mirror each other, but the run through a brick wall comment for him uh, from McCarthy Forno. What did you, uh, what'd you kind of make of that? Ah, it felt genuine. It, it felt real. It it didn't feel like it was scripted or contrived because some sometimes these things, you know, the camera's rolling and you know it's going to be used for entertainment purposes later. Sometimes your brain might just go to that and be like, hey, I'm going to kind of play it up for the camera. But this was more of a hidden camera kind of thing where the camera wasn't blatant. You could tell it was in like the bottom corner of the room. It was just meant to kind of gather some basic information and gather stuff for not just entertainment but to also kind of see how interactions go and then you can kind of study that stuff later but o'connell pops up at the end and he's like uh, i had the quote up here because i actually wrote about it um when quasi goes and says hey we'd love to stay all day but you know we got a bunch of these Uh, o'connell's like pretty good man you remembered all that stuff and then mccarthy i just want to say i'd run through a brick wall for you and O'Connell was just like bubbly, uh, is his kind of fun loving, football loving self. And then O'Connell's like, let's go, man. And McCarthy followed up with anyone in the purple and gold. I promise you that. Like McCarthy was like super serious. And he said after that, that he had only told two other coaches that those two coaches he won championships with. Mm-hmm. So does that mean that the Vikings are going to get a third championship? Let's hope so. Let's hope that we can make that kind of correlation. But it it just felt natural. It felt real. And sometimes you can smell BS from a mile away. I, I didn't sense that at all. It, it felt like that's how these two guys were just genuinely acting in the moment. Kind of looking from afar, Miles, like Kirk and J.J. McCarthy, two very different. There's some similarities, I think, there that pe- people probably are sleeping on. But two different, I think, personalities to a degree. And also just two different ways they carry themselves. Maybe that's probably the better way to look at it. I think they both carry themselves in a different different manner. But do you see a lot of, like, Kevin O'Connell in J.J. McCarthy, like, personality-wise? Like, O'Connell's a very outspoken in a, in a, in a positively spoken type, type of guy. J.J. McCarthy is someone who isn't afraid to fire people up. I feel like I see a lot of J.J. McCarthy, like, personality traits in Kevin O'Connell and vice versa. Yeah, they're both like football nerds and like football junkies, which you can tell. Like, that's the one thing I noticed is Kevin O'Connell is like football all the time. I feel like I don't know. I don't know what he does in his spare time, but I feel like he doesn't do much of anything besides football in his spare time. And J.J. McCarthy has that same type of mentality, it seems like. Like, even right when he got drafted, it was like he's ready to get to work. It didn't. And I know a lot of guys say that, but like, I think J.J. McCarthy like literally meant it. He didn't want to go do this like press tour, do all that. He just wanted to go get to work and, and talk and play football. And I think. I think that's where they share a lot of the similarities. They're both football junkies. Um, I think the difference between McCarthy and Kirk is I think JJ, besides like being around like high profile football for a long time of his life, like high school, college, and now the pros, I also think he's just the personality that is he's way more comfortable around people. Whereas I don't know if Kirk says comfortable being in the spotlight 
being the guy having to kind of like put people on his shoulders and like answer for an entire team. Whereas I think JJ is used to being that guy. I don't think that's new to him. I think that that's still something that Kirk's still working through. I think Kirk's obviously gotten way more comfortable with it out over the years because he's got a lot more experience now. I just think that's something JJ's had like a runway for that's just natural for him. And so I, I think that's where like some of those similarities, like when you see personality, like we've seen some of Kirk's personality the last couple of years under O'Connell and those mm-hmm. things come out a little bit more. And maybe because the environment around him was a little bit easier to do that with. I think JJ was going to do that no matter who the coach is. I think that's his personality. I think that's just the type of person he is. So um, I think that's where they're very similar too. I just think they're both very like genuinely like bubbly, but like grab attention type people. Yeah. And that those are those type of leadership qualities are a big reason why obviously they liked McCarthy too. maybe the skill set and, you know, the actual football ability was going to take a little bit more time, but and I, I, again, I don't, I don't see Forno like the type of fakeness. Like I don't, I don't sense BS. I don't, I don't sense that it's an act. I think, as you said in, in your opening statement here, like I feel like that is who JJ McCarthy is, is very clear. And look, when you're coached by mm-hmm. a Jim Harbaugh team too, and you can handle Harbaugh and you love Harbaugh and a lot of the guys that play for him, as Alex Boone has explained with us before, love Jim Harbaugh. But I just, I don't, I don't sense there's any phoniness to JJ McCarthy. And I think him and Kevin O'Connell, like that it's a great like buddy cop type of situation. I'm I'm super excited to kind of watch the relationship develop even more uh, when the season actually starts. Let's be real too. NFL players can smell BS from a mile away. They can smell if you're fake. They can smell if you're not in it for the right reasons, if you're not going to do the right things. And Kevin O'Connell, albeit a very short-lived tenure, was a player. He was a player in the National Football League. And you can you can sense that and any of us in whatever industry we're in like i was in the restaurant industry for a decade i could smell if you're if you're just uh feeding me crap i can smell if you're being genuine like right off the bat like you you just get a sense the longer you're in an industry where you can understand some of those intangibles you can understand some of those little nuances with people and how to read whether something's legit or something's phony because it can make a really big difference in whatever industry you're in. And reading people is not necessarily exclusive to football. And I think that element is a really big deal. And McCarthy, as you said, like authenticity, it, nothing about him screams fake. Nobody's going to fake uh, sitting in front of the goalposts and doing like meditation yoga stuff. Like, you get made fun of for that kind of thing. <laughs> but if you go out and perform, nobody's going to make fun of you. They're going to be Absolutely. like, hey, you know what? Maybe I should kind of look at how I approach things because if that's working for him, maybe something like that would work for me too. You mentioned McCarthy did that, you know, Minnesota was on his short list of teams that, you know, he really liked and he thought he was going to go to. Who do we think some of those other teams were? Well, I mean, Oakland was around there, you know, where the Falcons maybe in on him. Patriots. I know that obviously like the top three teams, you know, we all knew Caleb Williams was going to go to Chicago. Who do you think, I guess, else would be like on that short list for you, um, for you miles that could have been like someone with JJ McCarthy that I'm trying to think of like another person that's like Kevin O'Connell, though, that would have been in that group. And I feel like KLC is such a unique head coach that I like short list. I, I don't know if I can figure out which one would be like near the top because the Vikings were clearly at the top. I think of McCarthy's short list, but I wonder what, who the other teams looked like. I mean, in terms of matching personality, Raheem Morris with the Falcons, I think, has got to be up there. Yeah. Um, I st- I just think he wanted to go anyone in the top five. So, like, Washington, it sounds like we've heard rumors that it's between Jane Daniels and J.J. McCarthy, not Jane Daniels and Drake May. So, I would assume J.J. McCarthy had Washington very high on his list for that very reason. Like, if he could go top five, top two, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, but, yeah, I think the Vikings, Washington, Falcons, but the – but again, as, as we talk about the Falcons, like Michael Penix is going to have to go through this. He's probably mm-hmm. going to be on the bench for a couple of years. So I don't know how much JJ wants to do that. Or like, obviously guys have no control over it, but um, I would assume some of those teams and I, I would, I would guess, I would guess Denver's probably pretty high up there just for the coaching standpoint, like Sean sure. Payton. I'm not the biggest Sean Payton fan, but I know what he's, he's good with quarterbacks. And I feel mm-hmm. like um, quarterbacks and, and prospects are going to like that. So um, that wouldn't surprise me either. I'd argue Brian Dayball for that same reason. Look at what he did with Josh Allen. McCarthy's not Josh Allen, but if he can take Josh Allen and make him into the quarterback he is, what could he do with me when I already have a better base uh, in front of me? Great point for For sure. 
yeah, D- 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 and Dayball, we'll, we'll see what, the, I mean, it's Drew Locke or obviously Daniel Jones there in New York. So I would love to, to see Dayball, what Dayball could do with Drew Locke because oh, Locke's big thing is it's all talent, no finesse. Like he, he doesn't know how to play controlled. He's always out of control. He's always panicking. Can Day, If Dayball can harness that, Drew Locke could potentially be good. Not great. Probably never better than like quarterback 16. Quarterback 16 at that price is an incredibly valuable asset. So I'm I'm really intrigued to see what he can do with him. We'll see if yeah, he can beat out Daniel Jones, but yeah, I true. could beat out Daniel Jones. <laughs> I, he's, I, he's got I some actually can, but no. hey, Ed, I don't. Ed, Ed, I, got him paid. I don't think Daniel Jones is that good, but I I think we we talk too negatively about him at the same time. Like I, it's I think because a, he went sixth overall. If Daniel yes, Jones went forty sixth. Well, I don't also think we his, talk about him nearly as well, poorly. Well, also his uh, his contract too. Like obviously the extension mm-hmm. of getting forty million a year is. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that too, but yeah. Does he with you. share an agent with Kirk Cousins? Because I may need to call him. <laughs> <laughs> Get a good payday. Yeah, um, right. And and then we just need to see like an SNL skit of Brian Dayball and Drew Locke performing Young Jeezy or something. I would be, I'd absolutely be 100% all about it. <laughs> yes, please. Um, Sticking on the New York side though. So Quasi also, I've traded up to 10 and he Gave Joe Douglas a call. They, you know, they traded a couple of those those mid round picks to move up the one spot to get JJ McCarthy to box anyone else out from also getting JJ McCarthy, which probably would have been Denver. Um, what do you make of the relationship formed between Joe Douglas and Quasi Adopa Mensa? Obviously, I think there's cordialness with every GM because you eventually you're probably gonna have to do business with one another, and probably you're just vetting uh, mm-hmm. other players too and and whatnot. But what do you make of the relationship and just some of the things we saw in that clip between Joe Douglas and Quasi? It's part of doing business. It's part of your job as a general manager is you need to build relationships with people. You don't need to just build relationships with players and agents and representatives. You need to build them with other people in the league. And that's how you get things done. Like you, you make trades with people that you're friendly with more often than you would make trades with people. You're not. And there is a connection with Joe Douglas and Quasio Pimenta, and his name is Andrew Barry. Barry and Douglas were with the Eagles organization for a long time together. And obviously, Quasio Pimenta worked with Andrew Barry in Cleveland. So there's that connection there. But you build relationships through meetings, you build relationships through conversations. General managers will have conversations offhand about players all the time because it's good to always inquire about different things keep your options open and you build that kind of rapport. These conversations, I bet if we would probably hear that the conversations about moving up for JJ McCarthy probably started around the combine, like initial conversations be like, Hey, if we were to, if our guy was there, what would you need to make the move down? Uh, yada, yada, this and that, like the conversations with the Vikings and lions, when they made that uh, faithful trade that resulted in Jamison Williams and Lewis those conversations started weeks before the draft because you want to lay the groundwork. You want to have those conversations early, get a baseline, and then you finalize it when they're on the clock. So it's good that he has those kind of relationships. It's good that he's talking about, hey, you, you need to build those kind of relationships because you do. It's not just about a results thing. You, In order to have results, you have to have the, the people aspect down. And I think based on uh, public perception that Quasi Dofimenza has that element down. And I think that's a good thing. Is there any GM miles that like you, you don't want Quasi to ever be doing business with and maybe not a GM, but like just a team. I'm just trying to think of, you know, that this can happen in baseball or teams just get taken advantage of like the, the Rays and Dodgers just think they're so good at identifying talent that maybe other people don't see to a degree. And they can sometimes fleece other teams. Is there another team and organization where if like you're Quasi and you get a phone call from general manager X is there a team that you're just like, I am not doing business with you at all. I don't trust you. I think you're a snake. This will be a bad deal. Does any of those guys like pop up in your mind of, of another NFL GM that you just don't want to see Kwesi engage with? I mean, it's already happened, but I mean, Howie Roseman's up, probably obviously up there. I feel like that's any team, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to four players. I feel like whether he's trading for or trading away, he usually seems to find a way to, for the most part, win those trades. Um, like getting a fourth, a future four. I was at a future fourth and a seventh. It was a, J- a conditional fourth, but it ended up being a That's fifth right. because Rager right. didn't perform. That's right. But still, like the Vikings didn't really get much out of Rager, and 
they got him off their books and they got a fifth round pick and a seventh round pick for him. I mean, for a, a failed first round pick, I feel like that's a, a pretty good return. Um, obviously, we have the infamous Sam Bradford trade, which I still think in hindsight wasn't like an awful trade. Like the Vikings were going to have to overpay for a quarterback at that level at that time after the injury. But um, how he just seems to always do well in a lot of the trades he makes. Um, it used to be the Patriots. I used to always feel like the Patriots were that team. Now I don't, I'm not as worried about them anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. But Bill Belichick used to be pretty good about like trading players away um, and like a, a year too early type of thing. Yeah. Um, right now though, that that's probably it. Like, and I, I would say like, like in divisions, usually always one of those things, but the Vikings have traded with literally all of the teams within the division mm-hmm. at some point. I think maybe the bears, are the, I can't remember if they traded with the bears or not. Um, no, they did to get a Caleb Evans. I think that's who they traded with. Um, I'll I'm give you mistaken. one Baltimore Ravens. Oh yeah. If the Ravens are yeah. trading with you. Yeah. You should probably reconsider yourself. Yep. Yeah. That's a good one. We did. Oh, well, I was with uh, Rick Spielman when we traded uh, in Gakwe to, to get anything back for, after that trade. But um, yeah, the Ravens is another good one for sure. They're really good at, they're just really good at building and like maintaining rosters. I don't know how, how they do it. They let, let so many guys leave the building and they're so good at just having retention mm-hmm. already built in house mm-hmm. and to step up in, in so many like valuable spots. It's crazy. They they built an organizational structure similar to the Packers. Yeah. Where like as much as we hate the Packers, their methodology of how they draft and how they build their rosters, pretty dang good. Because and who it's they been, pay. Cons- yeah, it's been consistent for 30 years. It's not yeah. flawless, but if you stick to those parameters, you're going to have wins more often than not. 100%. I, I also feel like, and this happened in the last few years, finally, like the NFL finally caught up. It's one of the rare things the NFL caught up to the other leagues on. It's usually the other way around. But the trade deadline in the NFL has now become like a legitimate thing, you know, like up until just like three mm-hmm. or four years ago, we just, we really haven't seen big trades up until these last three or four years. We're like in the MLB and the NHL NBA trade deadline day is one of the most marquee days on the schedule. And yeah. now in the NFL, we're starting to see some big trades that go down. I wonder just in general, like I, I, I know the league is also trying to hype up the trade deadline to a degree, but I just think you're going to see like just so much more general managers active. You're probably going to see it again, obviously for this year's trade deadline, the Vikings swung a big trade for TJ Hawkinson a few years ago. So I think it's just like GM's understanding that, Hey, it's not like in, like in, in baseball and you need a new batter, you need an ACE. Like you can plug that guy in. It makes life pretty yeah. easy. Football, football is obviously a is a different beast. Like you're, you're entering a new system. You're entering a new playbook. You're entering new coaches, coordinators, people like mm-hmm. it's not just, you know, batting fourth for the Yankees the next night when you've been playing for the, for San Diego, it's completely different. So. And the I, way I, contracts I move too. one, the way yeah. contracts move mm-hmm. in the NFL is not the same as other leagues in baseball, basketball, those contracts move with the players like fully. It's not like, Oh, we'll keep half. You keep half that type of thing. In the NFL, it's, you're going to have to maneuver depending on how that's, that's structured. Um, and how much yeah. cap space you currently have, how much cap space going out isn't the same as like the NBA specifically. Obviously, in MLB, there's no cap, um, cap, but some teams still don't want to overspend when they trade for guys too in terms of cash. Yeah, it, it's because of the the lack of signing bonus. I don't, I honestly don't think any of those leagues really do signing bonuses. It's no, you no. like. I think the NFL is really unique in that sense, and plus, like. The NFL, as much as it's uh, an individual sport and you need to play well, it's way more of a team sport than the other ones you mentioned. Because if you are a great athlete, especially in basketball, if you are LeBron James and you get traded midseason, you can go in and be LeBron James pretty much right away while you figure out the team chemistry. If you are LeBron James in football and you get traded, it doesn't always work that way because plays in basketball are a lot less complicated and a lot less moving parts than there are in football. So I think that's one of the reasons why people have never really embraced the trade deadline up until recently, because it was so hard for a player to come in and learn everything brand new on the fly. And and we saw that with Josh Dobbs. He had some success, but it waned really quickly. It's hard to learn a playbook on the fly because there's so many intricacies and so many like there are plays where you call two plays in the huddle and in in between those two plays uh, a lot of times the word kill and then if they shout kill at the line of scrimmage you're going to play two and you have to know both of those and you have to know your responsibilities and guess what 
if you are the tight end, you better know the tackles responsibilities too. And there's so many little intricacies that matter where it makes it so difficult. But I think the advent of the trade deadline evolving has, has been good for the league. And I think it also shows that so many people are running such similar concepts now where there, as much as there's creativity, a lot of it is relatively similar. Like if, if you traded Matt Stafford to the Vikings right now, how much of a learning curve is he going to have? Like a week? That's probably it. Like it, you're seeing a lot more of that nowadays than you would have in years prior. And I think that matters too. Well, that too. And I also think that teams understand that. At least I think Quazi is one of these people. They understand that you can recoup draft picks a lot easier nowadays than you might have been able to in the past. Yeah. The way teams maneuver in the draft and recoup draft picks. Like you can go get a six, a future a six round pick back pretty easily on draft day. So if you traded that pick back in in October, you can usually get that back at some sort of a trade back in the draft at some point, or like a pick swaps. Like the amount of pick swaps, and not just like that was. I think that was what seemed so weird when the Vikings traded made the, some of the trades they did in the in the first round of the draft is they didn't really get a, as much value back as we've seen them get before. Like with the T.J. Hawkinson trade, they gave up mm-hmm. a second. And a third, but they also got, I think, two fourths back. So it wasn't yep. like they just like completely gave up just a second and a third. They got valuable picks back. So we're seeing that more often. And I think that's helped make trades a lot more like even in that in that sense, too. It's not just like a, a one for one. You get a pick. I get the player and that's it. It's a let's let's meet in the middle and kind of like make it a fair dra- trade rather than just a lopsided. If you want this mm-hmm. player, obviously, it's it's a it can change depending on who you're trading. But like. That, I feel like there's a lot more of that. And then also, like like I said at the beginning, like more ability to recoup picks, especially when you trade the fifth, sixth, seventh round picks. They're a lot easier to get back than they used to be. Kwesi used the word minimizing regret and used that at the podium. It, I think it overlaid to or even talked about it in the War Room video that got released this week too. Mm-hmm. It is do those things that you guys are just talking about too, like correlate in terms of minimizing regret. Like you're, you're not just trading for one thing. You're also getting something else back, but also you're, you're putting yourself in a good position to get your quarterback of the future. Cause you know where he is and you're not going to sit there and wait. Like do those minimizing regret comments, like, I guess, wh- what do you take of those for now when, when you hear Quasi talk about that a lot? So it's really interesting. And you can look at this in a couple of different ways and let's start with the negative and one on the positive. The negative is he's got too much hubris. And if you if you are too aggressive and you keep a one track mind, then it it can end up being a really, really big negative for you because you're not opening your ideas and your mind to other potential outcomes. And I don't think he has that issue, especially with how he's talked about. We love multiple quarterbacks in this draft and we have to be ready for any situation that happens, especially in the first round. Well, guess what? They never expected Turner to be available. And they even mentioned it and he was, and they had conversations and they, they stayed patient and they got it. So I think that's the positive side. But the one really interesting thing about the minimizing regret um, is kind of a a different spin on it. That doesn't meant to talk about it really at all. I found it interesting that Quasey mentioned in that video that he told like the scouts, don't worry, I'm going to get your, these day three picks back. Yeah. because he knows how much hard work he did. And then yep. the entire motif of the day three picks was staying home and being patient, just waiting for the guy to fall. I, I found it really interesting that they kept both of those two things in there. Um, but I think the minimizing regret, it kind of plays in there in a little bit too, where you want your guys and you believe in your guys. And they obviously believed in all of their day three picks. And we'll find out how right or wrong they were in time. But minimizing regret is, okay, we believe in Kyrie Jackson and we want him. And we, th- we don't, we think that they thought he'd be available at pick 111 based on their simulations. They thought that was kind of the spot for him. So, based on their own models, they got him at a their approximate value. So, if you believe in Kyrie Jackson that much, well, do you believe in him enough to go move up for him? And their answer was no. Their answer was, hey, we're going to stay patient. We believe this is the best of the bunch. But that also tells you that they didn't think the drop off for missing out on him and then getting somebody else was so steep. And I thought that was a really interesting element in that minimizing regret because you don't want to regret paying draft picks when you don't have to. And And, that was really interesting. And the minimizing regret thing, I'm guessing this might have 
driven Miles nuts, but who were they going to take at 203? Did they want to take Jurgens, who they liked, or was <laughs> Will Riker going to get sniped? And right. Kwesi basically made the decision, no, like, let's get Riker, because I think Jurgens is still going to be there by the time we're back on the clock at 230. So they prioritized the kicker there, but they had both those picks in mind. Like, yep. the, the, eventually, like, I think Kwesi even said, like, we ha- we're going to have to make a decision here. Like, one of these two is, is going to go probably b- 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 between them. So which ones do we want the most? They went with Reichert over Jurgens, but I, d- I did find that super interesting too, Miles. Yeah, I did too. Well, and you look at it, I'm I'm assuming he was their top kicker on the board because he's the first kicker taken, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So that means he was their top kicker on the board. So if they viewed him as the best kicker in the draft, that means that, like, the level of where he's going to get taken is probably going to be higher than where Jurgens is because there's more available – interior offensive linemen than there are level of kickers that they felt at that spot was worth it. So I understand like why they would take Riker in that position over Jurgens because if they couldn't get Jurgens at was it 203 that they ended up taking him or to whatever it was, they they were gonna 230, thank you. They were gonna they were gonna find probably get another offensive lineman at that round at that spot that they probably liked in a similar range. I'm not saying that they would have liked him more than Jurgens, but they could have probably got a player within that realm that they felt you know the same Whereas like the kicker that would have been available at 230 was definitely not going to be a guy that they probably felt as strong about as mm-hmm. they did Riker where they where they took him. So I, I was all about that. I also thought it was funny. You guys had mentioned I was going to mention the the Quasi bringing up the I'll get those picks back. Um, I just think that, again, goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that Quasi understands that he can recoup those picks fairly mm-hmm. easily if he, if he wants to. Like like I think most of those, especially the, the round four, round fives, those trades are usually – happening a lot teams want to move around in those areas because those are the guys that they like really want to covet on day three that the scouts are like i really want this guy pound the table for go get that guy my blue star on day three type of player that um that you know gms usually talk to their scouts and their and even their position coaches about more more often than they do than just making singular like board board picks so um i feel like it's easier in those ranges for like crazy to recoup if you wanted to obviously like you said he didn't but I think that just goes to show that if he wanted to, he, he would have been able to maneuver and get a six round pick back if he wanted to move off of 105 or what have you. So I, I, I think that's fun. And I, I think next year already, I can always, I can already tell Quazy's trading back from that first round pick. Like I know I said that a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, but like I can almost guarantee, unless like some player, some crazy blue chip players on the board, they're moving back and recouping uh, a few of the picks that they gave up this year. Yeah, I'd be shocked, right? I mean, right now, before those comp picks come in and whatnot, and and again, acquiring assets, we'll see. Vikings obviously with just four picks in next year's draft. Pick nine, pick fifth, well, projected. A first-round pick, a fifth-round pick. uh, Yeah, two fifths and a seventh. So one fifth, one first, two fifth, one seventh. So just uh, those four picks. And you can kind of put put the the third-round comp pick in pen now. Yeah, because of of how like that that deadline's over and all that, mm-hmm. and the way that the new the new rules on comp picks. But yeah, still, it's it's not a lot. <laughs> they don't have a lot, but I think that third does help. It goes a long way to like helping why they were probably made, willing to maneuver and go get a Dallas Turner when they did with what they spent because they knew mm-hmm. they had some of that. They had a pick coming back, and then they can always recoup some of that like fourth, fifth round picks and any sort of trade backs. So yeah, we go ahead, my uh, Forno. Oh no, I was just saying yeah. Oh, you're just saying, yeah, you agree. You absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. We'll see what moving shake and Quasi ends up obviously doing uh, later on next year at the draft. And by the way, I know we, d- we didn't get any schedule thoughts. We haven't talked about the schedule at all here on Purple Daily on draft. We've given some thoughts there on some on some main episodes of Purple Daily. We'll get these guys' thoughts on that schedule too on a later episode of PDOD. We got more OTAs coming up, so plenty of awesome stuff. Football never sleeps. Even though I cover the Twins, uh, that, that, that might not be the the best decisions right now with how well they're, how bad, excuse me, that they are playing. Well, we so, got the Timberwolves going on too, Dak. The like, Wolves come on, are like... great, so <laughs> things are fine. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll be here on Purple Daily on Draft once a week. Again, we record this mm-hmm. a little day later, but hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. This is Purple Daily. This is specifically Purple Daily on Draft. We'll talk at you next week.